Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, so we got asked to just give this talk as part of the, the D.A.R.E. PhD group. So I'm going to be presenting work really, um, Kit's going to present his own work, uh, but I'm going to present work from both Josh, who's just finding out about this earlier today, and from another PhD student we had, Ray. Uh, and we were trying to think of a smart title for our, our presentation. Uh, what we really wanted to do is present to you today some of the challenges that we have in the coastal space. Uh, what we call big data is probably not what you call big data, um, but it's what we have to work with. So we'd also love any feedback that you have uh, on our work. Uh, it's just for some quick context. So Kit and I are based over at the Water Research Laboratory as part of UNSW, and that's actually over on Gamaregal um, country over in Manly Vale. And we're located over there because there's a very large uh, dam full of a fresh water source that we use for all of our modeling that we do. Um, so while Kit and I are mostly numerical modelers, our lab has about um, 60 to 70 people on it, but 50% of those are actually uh, industry funded engineers and researchers. So they work very closely with um, industry and do a lot of applied work like you see at some of these pictures. And then the other half of us are um, academics, PhDs, and postdocs. We also get involved with this type of work. There's me pretending to do some sediment transport uh, work, um, but we also do a lot of field work and modeling as well. So when thinking about today's talk, um, again, really was the idea of looking at how our, our data has transformed the way we can look and think about our coastline. So I'll present to you a little bit about some of the work that Killian and Yaren had did as part of their own honors and PhD work, and then get into some of the applications that we've done using data science and machine learning. The figure there on the right shows you, I guess, just an idea of, of the lack of data that we've had or how our data has changed over time. So the far, the left-hand side is 1975 out to just about present day. This was a figure from a 2018 paper of ours. Um, and the top one shows the cumulative amount of data that we've had along a certain beach that we have. The bottom one shows the different um, methods that we've been able to collect data. So our high-tech Emory, where we went out with a rod and stick down to, um, which was what we did at the, in the original time. So just looking at, so we go everything from in situ going down to the beach to using things like drones, UAV, flying LIDAR around, um, citizen science down to satellites now. So while we do a lot of work in a variety of different um, areas within the coastal, today we'll really focus in on shoreline change in that and how we've been able to understand that through the, the decades or our changes. So again, there's a picture there of some of our more classical in situ ways of uh, collecting data. Josh is sitting there on the quad bike as part of his PhD, some of the stuff he did there. Um, out to when we started doing UAV work and could get nice 3D maps of coastal erosion from a storm down to, this is our long-term data set. Our profile six, this is at Narrabian Beach. So when we talk about collecting data at a beach and which is in a really um, a harsh environment, you know, for us doing a single line on a beach might be all that we have. And Narrabian Beach in Sydney is pretty much the only beach long-term where we had data in Australia for the last 40 years, where we walked five lines on that beach and called it lots of data. And by world standards, that was still a lot of data for the coastal community. So when satellites uh, data became freely available, that really opened up for us the ability to start looking uh, at other beaches as well and to see how representative that one beach was for us. And so on this beach, you can see we can draw the dash, the thin dash line sort of gives you an idea that this beach is in some form of long-term equilibrium. It's a fairly straight line through it, but we also see this low frequency oscillations in there as well. And so if we're trying to create some sort of understanding of it, what are the processes that we need to understand um, and how do we model such a system? So the first thing was collecting data. So this is the COSAT toolbox that Killian developed as part of his PhD. It's freely available on GitHub and has given us the ability to use the Landsat and Sentinel data to be able to map any beach normally around the world over the last 30 plus years. So again, really opened up our, our ability to start looking at broad scale um, change. We know satellites are, aren't going to be as accurate as if we were in in situ data walking a beach. Um, we've got 10 to 15 meter accuracy when we compare that to the survey. So it's better than the actual footprint of the satellite data. Doing some sort of uh, doing some little bit of machine learning in there as well. 
We do correct for tides, because as you know, images are taken at a certain sort of time of day, but tides don't follow that same pattern. And so we have to correct for that. And we do that by estimating a beach slope um, from actually all the data that we have, all the satellite data. You look at it in frequency space, you can alter a beach slope or an estimated beach slope to remove the energy at what would be the tidal frequency uh, to get uh, an estimate of your beach slope. So it works really well in something like Nerebian, which is fairly microtidal and a steep beach. But we also know that this can't always be applied everywhere very well. This is an example from France, um, really high wave energy mesotidal, a large tide range here. So on that image there, it's a high tide one. You can see we can delineate the sand from the water fairly well. When we go to a low tide image though, things start to look a little less clear for us from an optical signature. So the waves are still breaking sort of off the shore. That's the white line, but where our uh, algorithms are mapping a shoreline becomes a little bit more convoluted. And so we still have work to do to try and understand how we can use this data reliably to look at longer term change. The other things that we have to consider, you know, when you take a picture of anything, it's an instantaneous image. So I said, we, we know how to correct for tides. Correcting waves is a little bit more tricky because it also requires to know something about the waves, which we don't always have. Uh, so we have something called setup, which is the, the mean sort of elevated water level that exists when you have waves on. And then run up is when you're sitting on the beach and you see a wave go up and down, that's run up. So when we take images, all that's in those, in those pictures, but we have to somehow try and correct for those. And some of those are really big signals on beaches, particularly flat beaches with big waves. And then some beaches like Nairobian, that's actually quite a small correction change. And so um, whether or not we have to correct it, it totally depends on beach specifics as well. Uh, going on that theme, I guess we've also developed a, sort of a sister set of codes here and looked at it, applied it to the CubeSat data. So much more high resolution data now, um, but only available since about 2016 reliably. So for a future, this means we can now start to get data uh, daily um, at sort of four to five meters accuracy for us. So this is really gonna help game change or replace us going out to a beach because we can't get a whole lot better than that. And it takes you know, a day for us to go out and survey a beach reliably. So great for doing if we want to look at a, a storm response, for example, before and after, we likely have a good chance of getting an image right before and right after, which we wouldn't have with the, the Landsat images as much. So for us, this is lots of data. For you, you might be going, that's still just a pin drop into what I have available for. But now what can we do with this data? So again, we, we do a broad range of stuff. I'm going to really focus in on our shoreline modeling work. So how we can change, uh, look at coastal variability. Uh, and what also we can learn from those models. I think that's something that our team really likes to dig into. We like to try and pull apart models and see what they're actually telling us from the, the inside. That's a lot what Kit's gonna show you and what Josh has been working on too. Um, so to start with, I guess I'll just start, we're gonna build up from the, the bottoms and the basics and then I'm gonna get to what these guys have been working on, which is a little bit more black box. So here's an example of a time series. Again, this is just a, a different transect at Nerebian. This is just a screenshot from the CoastSat website where any data that we've already mapped, you can go and download and have a look at. So if this is what our, our target is, we know that shorelines are gonna be influenced by the waves in some fashion. So wave height and period are probably important for us. Again, we see some sort of long-term equilibrium response. And so can we try and formulate a model using those ideas? Uh, and this is really what I did as part of my, my first postdoc was to try and create a model that could map or predict long-term. And by long-term for me, it was five years of shoreline change. So background, I guess, on equilibrium states, I like to start with a spring. Everyone understands a spring. You know, if you pull it or squish it outside of its lowest energy state, it wants to restore to that. And so that's the concepts that we're using in these models as well. We can see that those beaches tend to oscillate around some sort of long-term equilibrium. So let's try and create a mathematical equation that can represent that. It has been done in a variety of different sort of coastal spots. An equilibrium profile um, is just looking at the cross shore profile of a beach. So we do know that those are fairly consistent with the wave energy and the grain size. So that's something that a guy named Bob Dean did in the 90s. Uh, sandbars, that was my PhD, trying to figure out if I could see how sandbars move back and forth. Also very driven by equilibrium and the wave heights and how those change. 
And then a whole slew of us have also developed shoreline models along the same principles. If you want to think of those conceptually through, through pictures, I'll go through about 20 days here. These are images that are taken from our camera system at Nairobian, so it's all Argus, and they're called time-lapse images. And so what they are is a 10 minute average taken on there. And so one of the things we can do from them, you can see from the top row of them, the surf zone has white areas. So that's preferential wave breaking there. And those correlate really well with things like sandbars or shore breaks. So on the top one, uh, we've got a really accreted beach. So it's really wide. We have very low wave energy because I'm only seeing the white lines right at the shoreline. Um, so we would expect little change because we have very little energy going into the system, small waves. And that's likely in rough equilibrium with the, a beach that's well accreted or in a really recovered state. A few days later, a big storm came through, as I like to do in June here in Sydney. And you can see um, over that period of four days, the amount of beach that's eroded back. These houses are now precariously sitting in sort of harm's way. We can see that we've exposed some of the existing rock walls. This is where the seawall's gone in now. So it's a historical problem. Um, so now we've got an accreted beach, high waves, really at an equilibrium, we saw rapid erosion. But if those waves continue, and again, you can tell it's still a high wave energy because the surf zone's all white, it's not like we continue to see to another equal amount of erosion happening back there. So yes, there's rocks that stop some of it, but in some areas, that's still a natural beach, so nothing's stopping the erosion, except this concept that we think that it's now gotten more in equilibrium with the higher wave energy. So the sand that was on the beach has gone offshore, formed a nice big dissipative sandbar, wave energy drops off there, less it happens on the shoreline. Storms don't last forever, so then the waves drop, and we assume that that beach now will start to recover, but it will recover slower than the storm because we have less wave energy available to move that sand on there. And so that's sort of the concepts that we're following. And so we create this really complex equation, it's one line, we say that the change in shoreline dx dt is going to be some function of some coefficients that we can solve for. P is the offshore wave power. So just think of that as wave height and period. And then some disequilibrium state. Most of the models, this is where they vary. It's what it, what, how do we define our disequilibrium state? In this here, this is also a function of the wave height and the wave period and the grain size, these two terms, all right? So if we look at that a little bit more, and this is Kit, we'll get into more of this when he looks at his own models. We define that background equilibrium state as some function of the wave history for us in there. Other people look at it as the history or the, the relation to the shoreline and the energy, as we saw in that series of pictures. But we're looking here at the sort of weighted time history and the length of time we found out was fairly dependent on the type of beach that you were at. If you're at a fairly high energy beach, so you sit more on the right-hand side of that figure, and that's the top beach you see up there, that's Gold Coast, you tended to have longer memory. So they tended to oscillate more on seasonal time scales, more um, lower energy beaches. These are all Narabian, all sit in this area here. And so they tend to be more reactive as well to it. Lower energy, more storms coming through. So we knew that this sort of model in its constant state worked really well over sort of the five to 10 years um, when we developed the model. At the time, that was the full amount of data I had available around the world to be able to test it. And I think I had five sites that I could do my model validation on. Um, when Ray came uh, to do a PhD with us, we were starting to have availability of more data, but we were also seeing that the longer these data sets got, the less the model could continue to be skillful. And so we were missing processes and we knew that. And could we figure out how to fix our models to just keep doing well over time? So by sort of comparison here, this is the Gold Coast um, up just on surface paradise is where this data has come from. We've got cameras up there as well. And so you can see in those first four or five years that we have that data, there's a fairly strong seasonality signal in there. It goes up and down, fairly well behaved in terms of a shoreline. So if we calibrate a model to that time period and then project it into the future, you can see it does okay, but it doesn't do very well. If we then say, well, what if I just recalibrated to this side? Because most of us have calibrate models. No, you can pick the data you want to calibrate to. We can do a little bit better, but those two coefficients aren't the same anymore. So the model has adjusted its parameters to best fit the data. 
And so what we wanted to know was, could we train some model to adapt to those parameters in there? And this is particularly important for us because managers in the insurance industry and lots of people who live near the beach want to know what's going to happen in 2050 and 2100. And if we assume that the model that we trained on a very limited data set is going to, have, going to be consistent through the future, yet we know that things like waves and storms are going to change, we're likely going to be giving fairly bad predictions. And so how can we help create models that can adapt or think uh, we think they can adapt based on what we've seen? So part of Ray's PhD was to see if he could detect time varying parameters um, using different methods, apply those parameters to a model and see if they would still do well outside of their training, uh, and then also compare it to the existing model. Because if it's not gonna do better than the model we have, what's the point of creating a new model? Except someone wants a paper maybe out of it. So what we did was use a common filter approach for this. And now common filters have definitely been used uh, yeah, a lot in the calibration process. And in the coastal space, they've also been used on models like this to train it. And so the more data you have, the idea is that the more they can um, sort of hone in on what you think are the best coefficients. However, when they do that, they set this process noise that's in the common filter to be really small. And so you really force the model to come up with one single variable. So I look at like a stationary process. And then they usually have some other term sitting out here. That's the catch-all for everything else. And that term can vary wildly. So what we were doing though, is we we're gonna try and flip it on its head and allow the process noise in some of these terms to be bigger so that the model could um, vary those terms over time and then see if we could relate that to changes in, for example, wave conditions. So as both Kit and Josh know, I'd like to start off with synthetic data because at least I know what the answer should be before I go to the real data that has lots of other things going on. So we started out with Ray doing synthetic testing here. So what we had was observed waves from offshore somewhere. We created a shoreline using our known model. So we gave it the seas and the phis to generate a known shoreline. We then added noise and spacing and stuff to it as well. And then we saw how well the common filter could track that. So as an example here, we've uh, included some sort of low frequency variability in the C terms out front. And we've given it a stepwise change in the, the phi term, which dictates how long my, my memory is in my beach. And so by applying the common filter technique, you can see the black line here is the model learning those coefficients over time. But it seems to do a fairly good job at being able to track those changes that we've imposed. And so this gave us confidence that if we then applied it to real data where the red lines weren't known a priori, it likely was going to do a sensible job at picking out something we'd expect to be there. So that was his next one. So now we're at the Gold Coast, and here's 30 years of data, because we now have the satellite data available to us as his PhD progressed out there. And we took the middle section as our calibration data, and then we really just run the model from point one all the way through to see how well it does. The middle section here was chosen more because you've got more data available here. The beginning, the satellites are still pretty sparse. And we did know we needed a minimum amount of sort of monthly frequency data to be able to, to do the calibration. Um, but we did do some sensitivity on that as well. So when we let the common filter run, the two bottom plots here just show what the output of the common filter was for our two or three different coefficients that we had but we wanted to try and create relationships for these because if we're going into the future, we don't have a common filter or shoreline to be able to figure out where our observations are gonna change. So what we tried to do was then relate those coefficients, changes in them to different things we knew we could find. So we know that we're gonna have future wave conditions likely available to us or observations. And so that was our goal was to see if we could relate it to different wave parameters. So we tried a whole bunch uh, what the best fit was, was actually down to this dimensional fall velocity again for us. Conveniently, that seems to be what we constantly use in our models for our group. Um, so you can see these linear fits. And again, we were trying to do fairly simple fits. They're not perfect, but they capture some sort of change. And so if you apply this change, so you'll see the model will start here. The red is the time varying coefficient. So it allows those linear lines to update the coefficients of time based on the five-year running average of what the wave conditions were coming through. The blue is when we assume that those model variables were constant. 
So we still applied a common filter, but that's where we assumed very small process noise, did it over that same training period and used the best fit coefficients at the end. So what you can see and where some of our challenges exist, if we assume these constant parameters, our models tend to drift over long periods of time, but if we allow them to adapt, they seem to track much better. And so that was a really nice outcome from that work and hopefully gives us more confidence when we go into the future for it. So Ray just finished up his PhD uh, last year uh, and then we haven't quite figured out where we're going with this yet on this point. So um, now I'm gonna pill for a bunch of Josh's work. He's sitting here, so I could get him up here, but he probably knows the stuff better than I do. So if you have questions, you can ask him on that side. <laughs> That's how it's gonna go. Uh, particularly as I can see my, my voice is going quicker. Uh, so Josh is PhD with us, uh, not on shoreline modeling, but when he stayed around for an extra year or two, two years, three years, I can't remember two, yeah. Uh, he did do some, he did some shoreline modeling with us. And again, where he was trying to do was do some machine learning, but then really also try to figure out what was that model learning actually, or what can we pull out of that model? So he moved to uh, looking at, so part of our larger shoreline, we have a global community of shoreline monitors, about 20 or 30 of us. And um, when we got together for a competition in New Zealand and we tried to see who could create the best model, turned out some guy in computer science who had no knowledge of the coast was the best one. So, um, uh, when you're agnostic, you don't care what the actual variables are, it works not too badly. Uh, so we did uh, Nairobian, Sydney, Tyrua, and New Zealand, trying to compare them again. Uh, so he was looking at a, a standard neural network structure for this one. According to the notes I have in his slides, he also looked at LSTMs and RNNs and a few other types, but this is what we've got here. Again, similar inputs. So wave height, period, wave direction, he included water level and the antecedent beach position, that's the X term there. Fed it all into a neural network. We predict DX, we don't, we learn that we don't predict X very well. And part of that is, uh, goes down to this beach state memory that they have. Where a beach is gonna go is highly dependent of where it is now. You can imagine that the wave height, a big storm comes through um, or a small, a small wave, how much sand gets moved is really dependent on, on where that beach state is. So we predict DX, then outside of it, um, he feeds back in the last known shoreline position during training, but the last predicted shoreline position during the modeling run, and we get our new updated XT. He's nodding his head, so I'm remembering it right. Um, that's just some of the variables that we had there. It had four layers, a couple neurons, get the drift. So we were predicting three days uh, data. He was predicting three days. I really shouldn't use the word we here at all, but we had input data every, every six hours. Um, and he then sort of fed it a history of data into there at the time. So this is something slightly different to where, where Kit's gonna show you where you know, he's not gonna feed in a, a history of it. He's gonna see if his model can learn all that on its own. Yeah, all right, good. So the model does fairly well. Nairobian and Tyrua, um, he did this as part of a 10 pool cross-validation. This is just one example. Uh, so model learns not too badly. You can see that in both cases, these are not nice, simple sine curves that we're trying to predict. Tyru, for the most part, one of the trickier sites to predict, it does a lot of weird things. It's not necessarily well correlated to the wave data. Part of that being it's sheltered, it's an embayed beach. So there's other processes that are happening here as well. So fairly happy with this. Um, but as I said, our group likes to figure out why things are working and what are the key variables that we need. So we're coming back to what is the physics. So in this case, the left-hand plot for you is the change in root mean square error as we were to take out variables and the change in the, the correlation. So you can see that the model really needed that last shoreline position to be skillful. So again, this beach memory state is really important to understanding where the beach is going. Less so um, the wave conditions. Correlation though, wave heights definitely still were driving something in there. And to give you an example of what that looks like graphically, the figure on the left shows uh, the model when it wasn't given the previous shoreline position versus when it was. And you can see it's just got this really large scale pattern showing up in here compared to what the data really was showing has happened. So strong controls on that antecedent condition. And when you think of that comparison to the, the models that I showed you with the one lines, this is sort of similar to that disequilibrium term that we have in there. We need to know something about the past to understand where we're going. We also looked at the amount of data we need. As I said, we're fairly data scarce. Uh, when we're lucky at these two sites, we have cameras. And so we have daily data that we can get at. 
satellites though were every 15 days. And so if we had less data available in time, um, would that actually influence it? So the, the number of months of data he gave it didn't seem to influence very much. However, the range of that data that it saw was fairly important. And that should make sense to us. We realized that most of these uh, machine learning models don't tend to predict too well out of scope, out of the data they've seen. And so as long as the training data sort of experienced that range of it, that seemed to be more important to driving its skill than the amount of data that it saw in terms of time. This is also when we downsample the data. So the, the top plot shows if we gave it all the data we had uh, versus more representative of, of satellite data. If we downsample, the model doesn't seem to change its skill very much. It's still able to learn. And I think part of that is it's because we're integrating in time. And so it still has to get to the same, same spot. It may not be able to learn as fast, um, but does still learn well. That's the end of me. That's going to get up and tell you about PhD. So um, just in case anyone forgot in the last half an hour, uh, my name's Kit. And again, I am a PhD student working out of the Water Research Lab as part of UNSW. Um, my supervisor team includes, of course, uh, Kristen, and then Des very own uh, Lucy Marshall and Josh Simmons. So um, today I wanted to present some of the work we've been conducting on the interpretability of um, LSTMs in the context of shoreline forecasting. Um, and the reason we're doing this is because in the very short term future, we're going to be looking into physics and form neural networks. But before we got there, I wanted to uh, perhaps investigate what physics, if any, an LSTM can learn all by itself. So uh, about 10 months ago, when I started my uh, PhD, I stumbled across the following paper, hydrological concept formation inside um, LSTM networks. Now, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with this paper, um, but essentially, it wants to know if it's possible to extract information from the learned representations in an LSTM that map inputs to outputs, and then uh, interrogate those mappings for a representation of physical hydrological concepts, something physical, physically uh, realistic. Um, I really liked this study and what it was trying to achieve and the methods it used, so I applied it to our own uh, domain. But before we go any further, um, of course, a lot of people will be familiar with LSTMs and very well versed in them, but if anyone's not, um, essentially, they are a special architecture of neural networks that lends itself very nicely to learning long-term dependencies in data, um, which is why they're so kind of favored for time series forecasting. Now, one of the particular aspects I want to focus on uh, in this presentation of the LSTM is the cell state. Now, the cell state, you know, through training, stores um, in data and information from the past, and that allows it to um, have a much more powerful prediction going to the future. But for the purpose of this presentation, I'd like to just think about it as the memory of the neural network. So why am I focused um, on the cell state? Well, as I just stated, for the LSTM, we have the cell state that kind of embodies the memory of the network. And then on the other side of the spectrum, kind of on the, the model spectrum, for a behavioral model like Shawfall, we have kind of somewhat a parallel component that is um, that is kind of accounting for past conditions. And that comes in the form of the time varying equilibrium uh, condition or omega, as uh, Kristen explained. So both of these, albeit fundamentally different modeling methods, both have a aspect of memory to account for. And so hopefully you can maybe start to see where I, I'm going with this. Um, because we know why Shawfall works, but we also want to deduce if the LSTM is kind of finding um, a similar means to an end, or if it's doing something completely different, we don't understand. Right, so the experiment, um, it serves a dual purpose goal. First of all, um, to of course generate a somewhat successful LSTM model that either emulates or uh, surpasses Shawfall. And then secondly, and far more interestingly, to inspect the intermediate variables, or really that, that memory state for a somewhat analogous re representation of that equilibrium condition that is responsible for the predictive power of shortfall. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to um, uh, supply the LSTM and shortfall with both the same wave input data, um, allow them to independently calibrate in their own respective methods. Um, as that is done, shortfall will calculate a value of this uh, equilibrium condition throughout time. And then concurrently, the LSTM will, of course, train its weights and, and have values for the cell states, that memory. So um, at that point, all that's left to do is effectively 
map the cell states of the LSTM to um, the, the parameter of interest, which is omega or that equilibrium condition from shortfall. And the way that's done is by using uh, something called a linear probe, which is the method they use in um, that hydrology paper. So uh, how is this done? Well, it's actually fairly simple. So once we've trained the LSTM, we kind of extract the cell states at every time step and collect them and collate them into their own independent data set. At that point, you can then um, match the cell states to their corresponding value of omega, which has been calculated by Shawfall given the same data set. Um, and what you're left with is a completely new data set of inputs and targets uh, representing the cell states of the LSTM looking to map towards the target variable omega. Then all that's left to do is actually just map um, the cell states to omega. And the way we do that here is a simple linear regression model, um, although there's no limit to how complex that model could be, but I it is perhaps advantageous when it comes to interpretability to keep things as simple as possible. Um, and we're going to be using uh, that Pearson R squared uh, correlation coefficient to kind of measure the success of how well it can map between the cell states to the equilibrium condition. And then hopefully what you should end up is with is something like this uh, time series. Um, but you'll see some better examples in a second. So uh, much like Kristen said, uh, we like to start with synthetic cases. Um, and for the synthetic control experiments, what we did was we used Shaw4, fed it wave information to actually generate um, synthetic shorelines. And the idea here is that we were creating the ideal conditions for an LSTM, sorry, for an LSTM to possibly um, derive a representation of that equilibrium condition. So um, if you can't do it here, then it's probably not going to be able to work in the physical sites. So um, we kind of systematically modified the um, synthetic shorelines by introducing noise um, as a percentage of variance, and then also um, by downscaling the resolution again to try and see uh, the point at which the LSTM can no longer learn and um, can no longer learn the equilibrium condition, which will subsequently lead to perhaps a poor model. Um, and we've chosen to vary that, that downscaling resolution from uh, daily data to about monthly, because that is pretty much the range. In the best of days, you get video imaging, which comes from sites like Narrabeen and Gold Coast, and then um, sites that have none of that and purely rely on like um, satellite-derived shoreline imagery, which would be about 30-day um, uh, increments. So um, we generated three distinct shorelines. Um, and the inputs to the model would be wave height, wave period, uh, wave direction. And again, this shoreline position at time minus one, which is um, obviously inspired from the work of Josh and Kristen and with the RNN. Um, so for these three different shorelines, each of them possess a distinctly different equilibrium condition. And I really just wanted to visualize what it is the probe is trying to map here. Um, so this is the target variable of the probe. And you can see how that filter length that Kristen mentioned, how that can affect the, the, the look of, of the um, omega state. Right. So the results of the synthetic control experiments. So there's a bit going on here, but on the left hand, on the left hand side, we have a model skill as, um, as measured by the uh, Bria skill score. And in this case, the, uh, the baseline is just the mean shoreline position. In the middle, we have the probe strength. Um, so that ability to map the cell states to the equilibrium condition. And then on the right-hand side, we have the relationship between those two metrics as we vary um, the noise and the resolution of the data. And then those three rows would be the three different shorelines that we uh, attempted to model. So really the, the takeaway here is that there seems to be some kind of relationship between uh, the probe strength and its ability to detect omega and the model skill. And if there was some kind of erroneous or coincidental mapping between the states and omega, well, we probably shouldn't expect to see any relationship at all. But um, given the results of the synthetic cases, we moved on to some uh, physical sites. So uh, the first one was Torrey Pines, which is in um, California, in the land of the free, the United States of America. Um, and well, to be honest, it is every modeler's dream. It is a very uh, easy, location two model. Um, it's very seasonally dominated, has a strong annual cycle. Um, and just from visual inspection of the shoreline, um, you can kind of see that it's very stationary uh, throughout time. 
So this would, a site, this would be a site where Shawful also does very well because nothing is kind of changing uh, for this particular data set anyway. Uh, and then below, you can just see, just to visually represent the inputs to the model, which would be, um, this is just the significant wave height going in, just so you can see what that looked like. So uh, we achieved a root mean squared error of 6.4 meters here. But as I said, it's a very easy site to model. And then um, now we have an LSTM that's you know, somewhat successful. What does then that probe output look like? So um, in this case, we actually get a very strong, well, a relatively strong probe signal, uh, R squared value of 0 0.75, which is a little bit higher than I was expecting for a, um, a physical site. So that provided some kind of early promise that we were going down uh, the correct path here. So uh, that was Tory Pines. And then we, once we had this, we moved on to another site, which again was um, quite, quite calm in nature, but uh, this is Benson Beach in North Head in uh, Washington in the United States again. So this is a slightly smaller data set uh, to deal with. Um, it achieved a uh, root mean square of 10.6 meters in the test set. Uh, but again, it's, it's fairly predictable. It doesn't vary that much. Um, the performance of the probe is not as good over a shorter time span as somewhere like Torrey Pines, um, but it's still uh, very much worthy of interrogation, um, as is the kind of the point of this uh, work, of this experiment. Again, the wave conditions are underneath it. So uh, for a location like this, what does then the, uh, the, what does the probe output look like as compared to the omega state that is calibrated by Shaw 4? And again, we get a fairly strong uh, probe signal, um, this time with an R squared value of 0 0.6. Um, so it's not as strong as, as strong a signal as uh, Torrey Pines, but it's definitely not nothing. So I've shown you two locations now, which were fairly simple in their, you know, in, in, in the way that the shoreline behaves, but it cannot be always, you know, sunshine and rainbows in the modeling game. So we then moved on to one of the harder sites, uh, which is Narrabeen and Colroy, which is located, of course, in um, Northern Beaches in Sydney. And immediately here, you can see that this, this site is very much storm dominated, which leads to a far more erratic shoreline in its behavior. And because of that, there is a significant drop in performance um, of this model. Um, we achieved a root mean squared error of uh, about 12 and a half meters. Um, but really the problems here are the big storm events that happened in 2015 and 2016 are vastly throughout the model. Um, now we do have some ideas going into the future on how to deal with that particular aspect, but um, it's kind of that particular aspect is outside the scope of what I'm uh, presenting today for in interpretation. So um, for the last two sites, Torrey Pines and uh, North Ed, uh, we had very strong probe signals. So again, once again, we apply the probe, map the cell states to the equilibrium condition, and we get pretty much diddly squat. Um, it has 0 0.2 uh, R squared value. Um, and that really, it's actually interesting because it raises the question of why that is. Why are other two sites that we get quite strong R squared values, but here, not so much. So I've shown some control experiments, some sites where everything seemed to go quite well, and a site where, um, you know, the probe strength was not that great. Um, but really, what's, and, and how the, the final probe output is interesting, of course, but well, I think what's more important is the journey that the LSTM takes to arrive at this solution. So I plotted up this, um, this output, which is the, the probe strength uh, throughout training. So after every iteration of training, it was taking the cell states and attempting to map the equilibrium condition. Uh, that was, conf uh, that was uh, configured by Shawfall. So what you can see here is we actually tested at a number of other sites that we haven't uh, got time to go into today. But there are some interesting um, happenings, for example, at the site like North Head, it seems to converge very quickly on a very strong probe signal and then kind of divert and throughout training arrive at a solution that produces a better model, but has cell states that less represent what, you know, a phenomenon we would deem important. Um, and then there's also sites like Narrabeen, which apparently, well, don't seem to be very interested in attempting to learn that equilibrium condition at all. But for the most part, for the other sites and including Torrey Pines, they seem to be indicating that the LSTM is learning something uh, beyond just the initial inputs given um, that may be somewhat analogous as a representation of um, 
of that equilibrium condition that is calibrated by Shaw for. So um, I wanted to show you guys this today because it's very much wet paint. Um, I'm not entirely sure, I haven't got my head around what exactly this means yet, but I know it is interesting. And um, I guess the point of it is to show that perhaps the final value of R squared is not, um, not as important as maybe the, the value or, or how it changes throughout time or throughout training. Um, so there's plenty more investigation to be done surrounding uh, this work, but that pretty much uh, brings it to a close. So um, thank you everyone for your patience and listening and I hope you enjoyed it or maybe even learned something probably from Kristen, but that's fine. Um, and yeah, thank you very much.